Americans spend millions of dollars every year on tranquilizers, antidepressants. How could it be that the nation with the most ease, the most luxury, the most affluence, have one of the highest degrees of anxiety? It's estimated that 43% of all adults in the United States suffer adverse health effects due to stress. And anywhere between 75 and 90% of physicians' often visits are trip, office visits are attributed to stress conditions. So many of the medications, and we are a very over-medicated society, involve tranquilizers, antacids, sleeping pills, heart medications, etc., that are taken to cope with stress or the effects of stress on the body. And so again, how could it be that the nation with the most ease, the most luxury, the most affluence, have one of the highest degrees of anxiety? The answer, it seems to me, is in the question. Anxiety, stress, and trouble are a part of living. They will come. Trouble is an unavoidable part of life. And the flexibility and the toughness needed to meet trouble does not result from living an easy life. And so naturally, where we come from a society at ease, we tend to raise people who have the most anxiety. They have not learned how to cope with difficulty. As Arizonans, we know firsthand that all sunshine makes a desert. That's why into every life some rain must fall. Because if there isn't any rain, nothing will grow. If you want your spiritual experience, if you want your character to grow, there's got to be some dark moments in life. Archibald Rutledge, who is a poet and author and an avid outdoorsman, tells a story of coming down from a mountain and meeting a mountaineer going up the trail with an ax over his shoulder. And they got to talking and the man said that he had broken a part in his wagon. And as he was going up to the peak, and that he was going up to the peak of the mountain to find a tree which he was going to cut and drag all the way down to repair his wagon. But man, said Rutledge, there are trees all around you. He said, yeah, but I want the very toughest tree, and the toughest trees grow up where the storms are the strongest. Rutledge went on to say, storms rend and they mar but they strengthen and they build. My wife and I visited a couple of years ago now a mesquite sawmill in Tumacockery, a little old town between Tucson and Nogales. They have an old uh, Spanish mission there that's preserved, a National Historic Site. And this mesquite sawmill, very interesting place to visit. They get their mesquite, some of it from Mexico, but a large percentage of it they get from the Las Cienegas National Conservation Area, a BLM managed land. If you drive towards Sonoida from Whetstone, you can see it off to the north, north east of Sonoida. And that land is set aside, they're trying to make it a natural habitat area like it used to be years ago before it was grazed heavily. And they've reintroduced pronghorn antelope. They have a very large herd. I saw it there just recently. A very large group, probably 40 or 50 animals together, grazing together. Beautiful sight, the pronghorn antelope, and they also reintroduced the black-footed ferret, where they used to be native to that area. And part of their process is to try to remove some of the old mesquite trees that live in the area because the mesquite have very greedy, very thirsty roots. Their roots can go down 100 feet deep or more and even wider in their search for water. 
And so the more mesquite there are in the tableland there, the lower the water table is. And so in their efforts to try to make the water table rise a little bit and make it better for the grasses that are native to the area for the antelope to graze on, they have given uh, special permission to this mesquite sawmill to remove many of the old mesquite trees there. And so they have some very large ones there. The mesquite that they grow there that's native there is a velvet mesquite, and that lives up to 200 years old. They're not huge trees, but they just grow that slowly. It's the fact that the velvet mesquite is the slowest growing of all the 40 or so species of mesquites. There's actually mesquite native North and South America. There's mesquite that are native to North Africa and the Middle East and even in India. There's different types of mesquites. But of all those varieties of velvet mesquite, the slowest growing, and that combination of that slow growth with the harsh desert conditions contributes to the character in the wood. Mesquite wood is very amazing, and they've got these big slabs there. And you can just see the grain and the character and the rings in the wood. It's just beautiful. They saw that down and they make a lot of different things with it. They make some larger items, some tables and chairs and doors, lamps. The main thing they sell, though, is mesquite cutting boards. Because cutting boards work really good with mesquite because it is one of the hardest and densest and toughest woods available. It's right up there with teak and mahogany of the woods of the world for its stability. It won't warp, it won't rot. It's very, very tough wood. And it can take a heavy amount of, of weight without being adversely affected. And so it's very beautiful when you look at it. Mesquite is tough. It is strong. Now there's a tremendous human dilemma because everybody wants to be strong, but nobody wants to feel the storm. You see, when God allows the storm, we're inclined to think that we're being either abused or neglected. And so our thought for this morning is this, through trial and discipline, God builds champions. Through trial and through discipline, God builds champions. Let's talk first of all about trial. Through trial, God builds leaders. Pampering does not prepare leaders. One of my favorite Bible characters of all time is Joseph. Talk about a champion, one who overcame adversity. But in his childhood, Joseph was probably the most spoiled kid ever to be raised in old Palestine. His father, Jacob, was 91 years old when Joseph was born. Much more of a grandfather figure, really, than a father. And he spoiled that boy, the son of his beloved wife, Rachel. I invite you to open your Bibles now to Genesis, the 37th chapter. Genesis 37. Genesis 37 and the third verse. Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. I invite you to keep your Bible open there to Genesis where we're going back and looking at different aspects of the story of Joseph. Joseph was pampered by his father. This coat of many colors, if you look at the original Hebrew, was actually apparently a long robe-like coat, one that would cover his arms, be long-sleeved, it would be long length, down to the ground. It was not the kind of a coat that you wore to work in. Jacob wanted to save his son Joseph from having to work. Once in a while, you find an affluent father or mother who wants to protect their child from having to work. That was the problem that Joseph lived under. 
But there was another significance probably to that long coat. It suggested rank. It suggested nobility. It suggested to Joseph's older, bigger brothers that father intended to pass over them and give the special blessing to Joseph. No wonder they hated him so. Joseph was favored. He was pampered. Joseph was pampered even by God. God gave him special dreams that let him know that he was going to be a great leader someday with a special work and a special position. Seventh-day Adventists feel pampered, favored by God. Everyone probably is very familiar with the following text. It's in Joel 2. You won't take the time to turn to it, but Joel, the second chapter, verses 28 and 29. We as Adventists take this as a special message for us. Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. We believe that we're a special people with a special message. We've been promised a special power and a special reward translation. We're very pampered by God. All throughout scripture, we're referred to as the apple of his eye, God's people, the apple of his eye. And we pamper our children and we sacrifice for them so they can have the best Christian education available. And Seventh-day Adventist parents wouldn't have it any other way because we believe that our destiny is something special, that God wants to take our young men and our young women and build of them special champions. He has a special work for them to do for him. To our young people, it takes more than pampering to build a champion. It takes more than a promise to build character. And although God has in mind an overwhelmingly great destiny for you, as he does for all of us, regardless of our age, just because God has a work for you does not mean that you are fit to do the work. That was Joseph's problem. Oh, God had great promises in store for Joseph, but Joseph had to go beyond the pampering before God could use him. And that might just happen to you. Today we're going to look at some of the trials that God allowed to happen in the life of Joseph. First of all, God allowed Joseph to be treated like a nobody. That was a new experience for Joseph. He had always been a somebody, and suddenly he became a nobody, about 18 years old. And when his dad sent him out to the pasture to take a look at how his brothers were doing over at Dothan, they saw Joseph coming, and they said, Here comes that goody-goody. Let's fix him. And they tore off that fancy, colorful coat, that hated coat. And they threw him down in a musty old cistern until some slave traders came by and they pulled him out and sold him for a $20 bill and they tied one end of a rope to Joseph and the other end of the rope to a camel and they pulled him off toward Egypt, a slave, while his brothers just stood back and laughed. Notice these two sentences now from Patriarchs and Prophets. For a time, he gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. Yet he learned in a few hours that which years might not otherwise have taught him. Oh, how we hate pain. How we hate being treated as nobodies. That's why no one really wants to start school as a freshman because school isn't so bad, but being a nobody sure is. I remember back to my experience when I started at Thunderbird Academy, and I didn't go as a freshman, I went as a junior, so I was older. 
And I certainly wasn't pampered, but I was pretty sheltered as a child. I really didn't get out much. I was very shy, very introverted, stayed to myself, didn't really desire to go out and party with the other kids and hang out with the other kids. And I really had no self-confidence. I had no self-esteem. And I was scared at the idea of just being left there, having to work full time, being dropped off in Phoenix. It was 115 that day when I was dropped off there. And I just literally wilted on a bench there. And when I saw my parents drive off and knew I was there all alone and didn't have a clue what to do, didn't know anybody, I just sat on that bench and I just cried my eyes out. Dear friends, it's when we feel ourselves alone and deserted like a nobody that sometimes God can do his greatest work for us. While the prodigal son was surrounded by his friends, God could not get through to him. But when his friends forsook him, the prodigal started thinking about his father, about his family. Is there anyone worshiping here today who feels alone? Somebody here who's been forsaken by a friend? Please don't give up. Because these times when we feel so alone can sometimes be the times when it's easiest to reach out to the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. The second trial that came to this pampered child is that God allowed Joseph to be tempted. The slave traders sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar was one of the officers in Pharaoh's court. Genesis, the 39th chapter, and the 6th verse. Genesis 39 and verse 6, And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Here again, if you go back to the original Hebrew, and the Revised Standard Version brings this out a little better, it says he was handsome and good-looking. He must have taken after his beautiful mother, Rachel. And Potiphar's wife was not blind, and Potiphar's wife was apparently neglected. Let's read the story now, Genesis 39 verses 7 through 12. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me except for thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Poor Joseph once again had coat trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible has been pretty frank with this in this story, hasn't it? May I suggest that sexual temptation is a temptation that is going to come sometime in life to probably everybody that lives. Satan uses that as one of his most powerful temptations. We certainly see the effects of that in society today. I think we ought to live life with that assumption that we're going to be tempted along those lines and plan our lives accordingly. The time to learn how to give CPR is not after you've met somebody who's quit breathing or whose heart has stopped beating. I saw just a couple weeks ago a story of three 11-year-old girls near Vancouver who jumped in immediately when they saw two older teen girls who were caught in a riptide along the beach. They had each just completed a life-saving course just days before. 
I think you ought to prepare yourself ahead of time so that when the emergency comes, you can just almost instinctively do the right thing. And I think that temptation ought to be prepared for that way. Here's a temptation that I think both men and women ought to presume that sometime is going to be thrown in our path. Let's think ahead of time how we're going to react so that we can succeed as Joseph succeeded. Only a fool drives down the road seeing how close he can come to cars that are meeting him head on. And yet sometimes we do that with our morals. How close can I come to sexual sin and not get hurt? Can't I just enjoy the attention? Can't I just have fun flirting with someone? That wasn't Joseph's philosophy. When Joseph was tempted, he got as far away as he could, as fast as he could, and Joseph was able to resist temptation. Trial number three. And in a way, I think this is the most difficult one because the third trial is that Joseph was unjustly accused. Now, personally, if I do withstand a temptation, if I do something that's really good or that's noble, that's admirable, I like to be praised for it, don't you? Whether it's at work or in the church or whatever. And when Joseph did something good and he did something right and something moral, when Joseph resisted temptation, you know what he got for it? He got thrown into prison. Keep your place there in Genesis, if you would, but I invite you to turn over to the book of Psalms. Psalm 105. God allowed Joseph to be unjustly accused. The saying goes, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And when Potiphar came home, I presume the story went something like this. That Jewish slave tried to force his attentions upon me. In fact, by the time I had screamed, he had removed part of his clothing already. And here's his coat to prove it. Potiphar was probably a little touchy on the subject. He was likely a eunuch. Those who held his position in the court usually were. And he accepted the story. To do otherwise would have belittled his manhood and it would have shown distrust for his wife's story. And so Joseph was thrown into prison. Psalm 105, now verses 17 and 18. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. See, the custom in Joseph's day for someone who had performed the deed of which he was accused was a thousand blows to the soles of the feet. Could you imagine how raw his feet must have been? He probably couldn't stand for weeks or months afterwards. You and I expect to be appreciated and loved and accepted and congratulated for standing up for what is right. And the real trial is going to come when you do exactly what is right and yet you are accused of doing wrong. And so God allowed trial to come to a man whom he had chosen to do a special work for him. But that's how God built Joseph into a champion. Trials can develop leadership because trials can teach us total dependence upon God. When finally one day in Genesis, the 41st chapter, Pharaoh had a dream and he sent to the prison for Joseph. Genesis 41, verses 15 and 16. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And listen to Joseph's response. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Do you remember that boy with that colorful long coat? who went to his brothers, who went to his parents and said, you are all going to bow down to me someday. This is the same Joseph after trial who says, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer. 
Only when a man or woman is ready to let God lead them can God dare be ready to let that person lead God's people. Joseph was ready. Through trial, God builds champions. But we're saying today also that through discipline, God builds champions. You see, God is trying to make something beautiful out of you. God is trying to make something beautiful out of you. But God is a bodybuilder and not a tailor. Now, a bodybuilder takes what's there and improves it. A tailor takes what's there and hides it. He adds a little here, subtracts a little something there, hides a little something somewhere else, and so we can look beautiful on the outside. But God works on the inside. God works like a bodybuilder. When you work with a bodybuilder, you've got to work along with the bodybuilder. When you go to a tailor, the tailor does all the work. We don't make ourselves beautiful, but God doesn't make us beautiful while we just sit back and do nothing. It is an act of cooperation between the human and the divine, and that's what builds champions. There is an old medieval torture device still with us, very much in existence and very active in society. And some of you have been experiencing it for yet another year. It's called school. Young people, probably about half the teachers you sit under, half the classes you have to take, you tend to look on as trials, right? Did you ever stop to think that the discipline of school is more valuable than the knowledge you gain? Now, I'm 61 now, and it's been a lot of years since I took a lot of those classes that I had to take, you know, those required ones. And then you wonder, why am I taking this? How am I going to use this in life? I'm still waiting to use most of that information. <laughs> but I believe the discipline that you learn in school, that's what's invaluable. Simply forcing yourself to plant your seat upon the seat of the chair when it's time to do so, whether you feel like doing it or not, and to listen to the instructor, even if he's boring. And to do your homework and prepare yourself. That is the discipline that school gives. That will help you all through your life. School is hard work. But the discipline it takes to make it through school is one of the most valuable things that school does for you because through discipline, God builds champions. Now, I'm a fan of a number of sports. One of my favorite things when it comes around is to watch the Olympics. And one of my favorite things about the Olympics is to watch the stories of the competitors, those who are competing and how they got there and how they developed into the excellence that they have done over their lives. It's very inspiring. You can't see their stories without being impressed that what a champion, champion is, is somebody with a certain amount, but not necessarily the most raw talent, who sets their standards maybe a little bit higher, who works a little harder than other people work, a person who is more self-disciplined, a champion is somebody who tries harder, who stays at it when the rest are just satisfied. And I think of the thousands of hours of training, of developing their skills, of always striving to get better, to improve, to learn from their mistakes, to learn from others, to always set the bar higher. Now, I saw just a couple of weeks ago uh, Pastor Randy Roberts from the Loma Linda Church. He was, uh, in one of his sermons, was talking about having recently met Herschel Walker. If you're not a football fan, you may not know who he is, but he was one of the most famous college athletes back in the early 80s, I believe, when he went to college. And he was a tremendous running back, tremendous physical presence. And Pastor Roberts was saying that when he met him, he was just impressed. He's 55 now. 
and still in tremendous shape. And he actually toyed about two years ago with coming back in the NFL and playing, even at past age 50, which is completely unheard of. And so Pastor Roberts asked him, how do you keep in shape? He's like 6'1", 225 pounds, solid muscle. He said, from the time I was 15 years old, every single day since I was 15 years old, so for 40 years now, he does 3,500 sit-ups every day and 1,500 push-ups every day. And I have done that many in my life. <laughs> and he adheres to a strict vegetarian diet for all those years. And he's an incredible physical specimen. So now you know the secret. It's out. A champion does that and if you are going to be a champion for God that's the way he builds champions too. I know sometimes especially our young people get tired of the standards and all of the rules and they're at home and they think oh we got so many rules and things that I have to do I can't wait to go to school and you go to school and there's even more rules at school. And then you think, well, okay, I'm going to go in my career, then I will get away from all of those rules, and there's more rules at work. And even when you come to church, we have rules at church too. You can't get away from it. You know, the discipline that comes from the outside is far from the ideal, but if it can gradually lead us to the place of self-discipline, that's when we build champions through discipline, and especially through self-discipline, God builds champions. Brothers and sisters, we misunderstand so easily God's purpose in our life. Can we understand today that God's purpose is only to help you become what you really wish you were, or even what perhaps you're already pretending to be? Desire of Ages has this beautiful quote. A quote, page 224. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. I came dashing out of the hotel one day and jumped into the taxi and said, I got to get at the airport fast. I'm about to miss my flight. And I knew that the airport was over in that direction, north. I knew it was north. But apparently the taxi driver didn't know that because he headed that way, he headed south. And I noticed that. And I knew he didn't have a clue where he was going and I told him so. And he said, you know, I've been doing this for a while, trust me. And so I shut up, he was driving, I was a passenger, what could I do anyhow? And I watched what happened. And he went in absolutely the wrong direction for a few blocks. And then he got up onto the freeway. And in a matter of a few minutes, we were at the airport and we were there in plenty of time. How many times has God done that to you and to me? And we know we want to go in that direction. Lord, take me in that direction. That's where I need to be. And God takes us in that direction because he knows that to go south is the best way to end up going north. And not always the quickest route, but always the best route. God would not lead us other than we would choose to be led if we only knew the end from the beginning. Trust me, trust me, I've got this. So God uses trials and God uses discipline to build champions. Does it work? It works when we let it work because what God can make of you depends upon your attitude when he tries you. Perhaps no life more than the life of Joseph proves that you cannot keep a good man down. He was like a cat. 
You know, you hold a cat in any position you want, and by the time he lands after you drop him, he'll be on his feet. A cat only needs about 12 inches. If you hold a cat 12 inches above the ground, he has enough time to flip over and land on his feet. They begin learning that behavior as kittens at three to four weeks of age. They perfect that in about six to seven weeks. God made them with a super flexible spine and no rigid collarbone. And when they do spin, the front half twists one direction and the rear half twists the other direction. And they were able to torque off the two sides and just spin around and land on their feet. It's amazing if you see like a slow motion video of that happening. It's incredible. Joseph was that way. You could make a slave out of him and he'd wind up being in charge of Potiphar's house. You could throw him unjustly into jail and he'd wind up being in charge of all the prisoners. Brethren and sisters, circumstances are no excuse for failure. And because Joseph succeeded anywhere God put him, God knew that he was ready to be put any place. When life goes harshly with you, when you have been tried and you have been unjustly accused and you have been betrayed, be like Joseph. It's not circumstances that direct our happiness. It's our attitude during those circumstances. And when God allows trials to come, if we let them make us bitter and we wallow in our own self-pity, God never gets a champion. Through trial, and discipline, God builds champions. We heartily approve of becoming champions. We all want to become champions for God, but sometimes we object to the methods that God must use to get us there. Are you ready to trust him today, to trust that he knows best? A crippled lady visited the potter's shop. It was such an effort for her to do so. Every day she lived with intense pain, every movement almost more than human could bear. But she watched that potter take a piece of clay and he began to knead it and he began to pummel it and he began to pound it. And then he started to rub it up against that wheel to shape it. And gradually a beautiful vessel began to form. Off in a corner, the lady noticed another pile of clay. Ah, oh, he said, that's my scrap heap. That's where I throw the clay that is not flexible, that is not pliable, that cannot yield. And as she went home, that dear lady knelt by her bed that night and she said, dear Lord, you can push me. You can pound me. You can shape me any way you want, but please, Lord, don't throw me on the scrap heap. Now, that's a big prayer. And it's a prayer that I'm going to ask each of us to pray as we close our service today. But before we do so, let's sing together our closing hymn, that beautiful old hymn, have thine own way, number 567. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, number 567.
If you look into your own life just now, maybe you've been suffering some things that you feel God is not being too fair with you about. Can you pray that prayer of faith? Lord, I know you're not going to lead me any place other than I would want to go. And if I ask to go north and you take me south, I know it's your way, just your way of getting me where I ought to be. Lord, you can push me and you can pound me. You can shape me any way you want. But please keep me flexible. May I be pliable always. Don't throw me on the scrap heap. Will you silently think that prayer over in your life now between yourself and your God as we bow our heads for our closing prayer? Dear Lord, thank you so much for being a God who cares about your children, who understands what we're going through. Indeed, a God who went through what we're going through. Lord, if there's anyone in our congregation today that's suffering from loneliness, that feels abandoned, that feels like a nobody all alone, Lord, draw near to them today. Be to them that friend that sticketh closer than a brother and comfort them and be their companion. Lord, as we struggle with our temptations that we have every day, may we be like Joseph. May we run from temptation. Give us the strength to overcome, to be faithful as Joseph was. And Lord, when you send trials our way or they are allowed to come our way, may we accept those trials with the right spirit knowing that you are with us through our trials. Through discipline, mold us and make us after thy will. While we are waiting, yielded and still, build us into champions for you. Or may it be the prayer of each one of us, young and old, Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. Amen.